to the national game in the person, first of all, of Jackie Robinson. Jackie was, so Branch told me, of a fiery disposition. But when he called him into his office over in Brooklyn and said to him, Mr. Robinson, I'm going to bring you onto my team. You're the first black man in the big leagues. And you have to face a great deal of unreasoning, unchristlike prejudice. But how you react will determine the future of your race and the future of athletics and the future of Christianity in this country. So he said, I, I've just got to tell it to you, and I don't want to be pious about it. You've got to act like Jesus. And when they shout obscenities at you, you turn the other cheek. Well, Jackie Robinson became an immortal. I'll never forget the day I saw him steal second, third, and home. <laughs> That's what did it. That park was filled with love that day. Now they've got apartment houses where the old Ebbets Field used to be. I always avoid the neighborhood <laughs> because I was an avid Dodger fan. Branch was a philosopher, he was a theologian, he was a baseball technician, and to go to the games with him, which I often did, and sat in the president's box, and it's great to go into a game without having to go through the ticket window. <laughs> His conversation was a, a blend of philosophy, religion, everything. Sitting over there with him one day, he said, Norman, always preach faith to your people. Tell them to believe in the Lord, to believe in God, to believe in the Holy Spirit, to believe in the Bible, and to believe that with God's help, they can handle any old thing. And he told me a story. He said that years, many years ago, 50, 60 years ago, yeah, there was what they called in those days the Texas League. And uh, the manager of the San Antonio team was a man named Josh Riley, a Catholic, a Christian, and a believer, and a very smart man. His team had lost the first 17 games out of the first 20. And this was surprising because he had six men on this team who could bat over 300. But Riley knew that they had what they call in baseball the jinx, which means they'd lost faith in themselves. They didn't expect to win. They didn't expect to get a hit. They expected to lose. They expected not to get a hit. And their expectation was being realized in fact. Now it so happened that in that neighborhood at that time was a preacher by the name of Schlater. And he was a, a faith healer. And he was getting good results because everybody believed in Reverend Schlater and all the sick would gather around him by the thousands and there were many healings because the people were believers. The psychology is involved in this also. So Joshua Riley, after they'd lost the 17th game, kept them all in the clubhouse and he said, now boys, I want each of you to give me your two best bats, and I'm going to take them away for a while. I'll be gone only an hour or so, 
I want you all to stay in the clubhouse here until I return. He took all the bats, he put them in a wheelbarrow, he took them over to Reverend Slater, <laughs> and he had Reverend Slater bless the bats. So he came back to the boys in the clubhouse and he said, these are wonderful bats. I've just taken them to Reverend Slater and he has blessed them. They were excited. They changed immediately. They hammered Dallas, Texas the next day, beating them 20 to 1. They hammered their way through the league. They won the pennant. Now, Branch says, if you'll tell your people that, they will be victorious. So I'm telling you. <laughs> now, we know that there was no change in those bats. Where was the change? In the minds of the men who held the bat. Uh, many times you stood up to bat, not on a baseball field, but up against a sickness, or up against a defeat, or up against a trouble, and you were ineffective. You felt that you didn't have what it took to handle it. Your faith was weak. But if that faith goes down deeply into the very essence of you, no matter what the challenge is, how difficult the problem, you're not going to walk in darkness. You're going to walk in the light of life. This is one element of the joy of positive living. I grant you it's a very simple illustration, a very unusual one perhaps to use in the pulpit, but so what? Whatever illustrates a fact is germane to a sermon, I would think. But how do you get this faith in depth? The best way I know of is to take this book here, which is the one continuing book of all time. Other books come, they hit the bestseller list, they stay on the bestseller list for a month, even a year. Then they pass away, and after a while they're forgotten. This one is the best-selling book of all time. Why? There's only one reason. It has the truth about life and about people. So if you want to become a person of faith, you read it until you have gotten all the statements about faith that you can find, and then you memorize them in your conscious mind and hold them there until they sink into the unconscious and when they get into the unconscious they have you because you have them and your attitude, your viewpoint, your whole manner of thinking becomes tinged and conditioned by faith. And I have seen many people do that across the years, whereas before they were defeated, now they became victorious because they had faith as the essence of their lives. There's a man named Charlie Duke. He was an astronaut. He followed Neil Armstrong. He walked on the moon for three days. And after he came back to earth, he made speeches, and he said, if I live to be a thousand years, a thousand years old, nothing could ever equal the sheer wonder of walking for three days on the moon. 